I think from from my perspective, the first thing we need to be able to do doesn't matter whether you're a recent grad, a new grad, a dentist who just wants to do simple plain dentistry is to be able to diagnose and diagnose the full mouth effectively. Hey guys, welcome to the CP Junkie podcast, where we bring you interviews with dentists sharing their CPD stories and journeys from around Australia. Hey guys, welcome to the CPD Junkie podcast, fam. I'm your host, Lawrence Doan, and today we're joined by Dr. Vandana Badwa. She completed her dental degree in 2004. Following graduation, she completed her ADC and worked at the Royal Dental Hospital of Melbourne in the emergency care clinic for two years. She has also practiced extensively in private practice across country Victoria and metropolitan Melbourne. She has taught and demonstrated to dental students at the University of Melbourne and has completed a postgraduate clinical diploma in implantology from Melbourne in 2017. In 2020, she was invited to join the All on Four clinics headed by Dr. Alex Favrinchenko, enabling her team to provide quality full arch fixed prosthesis, which are immediate, full fix, fully fixed, and final to both Western and Eastern regional Victorians. Dr. Vandana Badwa, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lawrence. Glad to be here. How are you this morning? Good, thank you. So um, tell us about your CPD or dental journey and how that ultimately led to your special interest in periodontal and implant regenerative therapies, soft tissue grafting and reconstructive dental surgery. So my journey started uh, when I was at Footscray with my first boss, who um, I eventually business partnered with. Um, So he was a really, really good mentor. I had a good mentor at the time. He was constantly looking at the kind of work I did. And over a period of time, he started to recognize that I did like and enjoy um, implant dentistry and surgical dentistry, so to speak. So in about 2013, he started encouraging me to look at um, the postgrad diploma in dentistry, in implantology at the University of Melbourne. Um, At that time, my son was only about two years old, so I could not commit to something that extensive. However, I applied for the said diploma in 2015, got through the 2016 cohort. um, And I think that was the best decision that I ever took. It was in some way also complemented by the fact that my practices were in an area there was an extensive need for implant dentistry. I, at the time, I practiced extensively in an area where there was no fluoride prior to 2014. So the DMFT index was significantly high. People had lost a lot of their posterior teeth. But at the same time, the area was relatively prosperous with a lot of farmers. So they had the money and the means to do good quality implant dentistry. They just did not want to travel to Melbourne. I think that kind of helped. Um, I also, in um, by means, after I finished uh, my, I think the best thing I ever, ever, ever did in my life was to go through the implant diploma at Melbourne University. It mm-hmm. taught me how to critique scientific literature properly. It taught me the relevance of restorative dentistry over surgical dentistry. I still predominantly do prosthetically driven implant dentistry. I still formulate some sort of a guide. It is not a 3D printed guide. It's always some sort of an analog guide, but I will always try and position my implants in the ideal prosthetic platform. Um, I have not had to ever, ever cement my crowns, and I'm very proud of that. I rarely use angle correction. It's always direct to fixture screw driven access. And I, as I said, I contribute this to the really nice professors at the university who drilled down that the patients after a fixed tooth, not an implant surgery. So I'm thankful for that. Well, let's dive back to where it all kind of started back in 2004. Did the young Dr. Vandana already imagine that she was going to head down this path or was it kind of something that was kind of forming along the way? That was um, so similar to um, if I go back to right before I even started dentistry, I never thought that I would ever become a dentist. Uh, It was not in my, it was not even my wildest dreams. My parents, uh, my father was in the army. We used to travel across India every two years. Um, I had a really good childhood. When it came to, I don't know if you're familiar with the process in India, but there is a qualifying examination 
based on which you are allocated a position in either a medical or a dental university. Education mm -hmm. at the time was relatively simple, free, and there was a steady stream of patients. Um, I gave my qualifiers because everyone in India is supposed to either be a doctor, engineer, or or or, need, or something of the sort as in any ethnic family. Yeah. Um, I got my results out and there were two places that I could go to. One was a medical university, but that was about 3000 kilometers away from home. And wow. one was a dental university literally around the corner. And that was the reason I chose dentistry for the convenience. Um, at the time, the plan was to practice dentistry, but see what happens and where life would take me. Yeah. I imagined joining the army after finishing dentistry, but somehow enjoyed over the five, over the course of five years, I met people, I saw private practices, I saw what could be done within the scope of private practices and that changed my mind. Yeah. Um, so similar to that, I had no intentions of exclusively getting into implant and surgical dentistry. I really wanted to, to practice the full scope. Uh, believe it or not, I really was not thinking of practice ownership at the time either. I was enjoying myself. I was cruising along. I had a really good job with a great boss in a private, in a preferred provider clinic uh, where I would just do scales and cleans and simple exams and families. It was stress-free, it was relaxing. But I think after about three years of doing that, um, I kind of wanted to do a bit more. And I think the turning point for me was that I did um, some sort of an Invisalign certification, but I could not for the life of me get any patients to commit to it. Yeah. I invested in a really nice camera, I invested in retractors, I invested in mirrors, uh, but I found that I was limited by what I could actually do or grow if I didn't have as many patients and at the time I realized I had to if I had to grow I had to move out yeah um, of, of a of a and there's nothing wrong with the preferred provider clinic but I had to move out of that particular demographic set so that let me let me let me just jump back a little bit here because there's a there's a lot of things that are happening really quickly at this point so you're telling me that you graduated and then what happened was that uh, you kind of you fell into place, so you're kind of like, yeah, I'll just see how dentistry kind of That's goes. Right. It takes me in life, and yes. then what mm -hmm. compels you to move from India to Australia, um, knowing full well that your dad, who's in the army, is probably going to be like, you know. <laughs> my uh, so the reason I moved out was obviously because I met my husband. He was here at the he Rohit. My husband's been here in Australia since 1999. Um, and again, it was not a very well thought out decision. It did work its way up. Uh, but I kind of knew, um, so it, you know that you have to pass the ADC exam. It's a relatively, I would not call it difficult, but it's a relatively challenging exam because you cannot practice dentistry before you actually fully finish the exam, which makes it stressful. The actual exam is not difficult. It's the circumstances around it and the stakes that kind of follow it. I finished the exam. I did my exam in 2008. Um, it was a, it was a relief at the time. It was there was obviously uh, it was like a chapter that started and a chapter that closed. Um, at that point in time, it was not. I think it was in 2012 that we started having some job shortages. 2008, it was still relatively easy to to find a position. So I finished my exam, I remember distinctly in on the 23rd of, or I think it was the 19th of October. And I was working at the, on the 23rd of October because it was still the dental board and you literally had to submit your transcript and you got your registration on the spot. So right. it, was, it, was, it was simpler times, it was simpler days. Um, and I, uh, the, the way I got my position was that one of my friends called me, said this clinic is looking for a position. I uh, come in now. I rang the receptionist. She said, yeah, come in now. I went there at four o'clock. I got the job at 4.15 and on a Monday and I started work on the Friday. Wow. <laughs> so, yes, um, once it started, it was um, uh, it was a, a, a simple bread and butter practice. Uh, we did the full scope of dentistry. We had 
um, digital X-rays at the time, which was a which was a great which was a novelty. Not a lot of practices had it. We yeah. had um, digital software to do charting and notes. But apart from that, it was a standard drug bread and butter practice. We did a lot of root canals. We did a lot of um, we did a lot of dentistry, which was um, essentially preventative and not majorly restorative. I also, uh, in the same capacity, I worked in the Royal Dental Hospital in the emergency care, where all day, every day, I used to take out teeth. I really enjoyed it. I absolutely mm -hmm. loved taking teeth out. Um, it was the only issue with that was that I could not follow the patients through. And it was unfortunately, there are a, some, there is a degree of uh, bureaucracy associated with any public organization, which is a, which is not which is not really a shortcoming, but it is one of the things um, yes. which is sometimes limiting your um, ability to provide adequate care to the patients. Yes. Um, so I only left these two positions because I had my son in 2011. Um, so I took a year's break and then resumed back um, partly at the Melbourne Dental Clinic and partly at a private practice in which was a preferred provider practice. Right, yeah. I mean, to your point, like I would say that, yeah, I agree, the, the public health system is built up where it's meant to be. We've only got this much resource and we need that's to right. serve as many people as we can. So exactly. that's why they're so limited in what they can offer, right? Um, but I want to come back to your ABC again. Sorry, I'm going back a few times. That's fine. But um, you mentioned really briefly there, you said that the exam itself wasn't the hard part. It was the circumstances of in it. So can you explain to someone who may be just a graduate, like from a, an Australian university, the difficulty or the challenging situation that you're in, um, in preparing for the ABC exam coming from overseas in yeah. your experience? So the, the, the reason why I say it was challenging is because you have to sit a, an English exam to be, before you can even register. Um, the English exam itself is fairly straightforward again, but for a lot of people who, for whom the primary um, language may not be English, and that can be a lot of Latin American countries, it could be a lot of Southeast Asian countries, um, it can potentially means staying in that same spot and giving that English exam again and again for a number of years before they can even move on to the next step, which is a written qualifier. Um, the written qualifier is only valid for a certain period of time. I think it's about two or three. It changes all the time. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but at the time it was for, I think, two, three years from the day you receive your results. Mm. Which also means that you have to finish your final exams in within that two and a half to three year period. Otherwise, you pretty much go back to where you started from. Um, the final exam itself is quite challenging because you are giving an exam in an unfamiliar environment with unfamiliar people. Um, when we sit an exam in any university, it does not matter whether it is Australia, India, Latin America, Europe, um, you often have an internal and you have an external examiner, plus you've had a full year of having some sort of a contact with that person. So your ability to, to clear the exam or your ability to um, essentially come through the other side does not depend on that 30 to minutes to an hour. It depends on your entire year's worth of treatment. So in that sense, that is challenging, that your entire, I would not call it fate, but what happens next is going to be decided um, in the next couple of hours. And the exams were quite expensive. So it's, I don't know how much it is now, but from the beginning to the end, it's about $10,000. Wow. Um, yeah. How do you do that? Because you're at the moment, you're not, you're not a dentist working, right? You, are you an correct. assistant or are you doing something non-dentally related? Like what's happening? Correct. Um, so I was not working at the time because it was, I did a six months university. It used to be five or six months at the time. It was called the orientation course uh, at the University of Melbourne. Again, it was quite helpful because I gave the exam at Melbourne University and I studied, the, like I did my orientation training there, which sort of familiarized me with everything. So I kind of knew where the, how long it takes to process an x-ray during your indoor 
um, station, how long it, where, what sort of endo holders or what sort of holders are available, what sort of rubber dam clamps are available, what do the examiners look like. So in that, in that sense, it was easy. Again, it was an expensive course, which costs about $30,000. So not everyone can afford it. I was in the right position to do that. Um, and I think that would have helped me from, it would have definitely helped me clearing the exam. The one thing though I do attribute to is uh, before I decided to give my exam, I, I decided to not worry about the results. Um, it was hard, but I thought, you know what, I'm young. I can do this again if I have to. Um, I'll just go home, have a break, come back and redo it. Um, and I think that attributed to me being able to clear the exam. The pass percentage is about 4%, I don't know, mm. between yeah. 4 and 5%. Um, however, again, most people eventually do clear the exam. It does take them a certain number of tries sometimes. Um, but again, it's, it's more about um, it's more about, I would say it's more about the fact that it's, it's perseverance is the, and patience is the key to those exams, not necessarily your clinical abilities, your ability to, to cut teeth or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm. The industry is the same everywhere. It starts similarly everywhere. There's maybe minor differences, but essentially every course, every university course is taught in a similar fashion. Yeah. So you eventually complete it, you graduate, I mean, you, you become accredited for it. And then you work in the private, uh, in the private um, practice for a little bit. And then you're also at the same time, you decide to pick up the university um, aspect of it. But you're saying that at one point it became a little bit too hectic. And so you have to cut back a little bit. Is that my understanding? That's right. That is right. Yeah. So I was working in a private, I worked in private practice and I was also working at the hospital to gain maximum exposure and experience. Mm -hmm. um, I reduced my, I, I kept my private practice, but I reduced my public commitments when I was pregnant with my son, just because of the fact that um, it was, I had to go to the hospital. I was not sick or anything, but I needed some hospital appointments, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point in time, I cut my workday down to four days a week. I have kept to four days a week ever since, unless and until um, something changes. Um, so yes, so that was the time I reduced my commitments. I did take a year off once my son was born um, mm -hmm. and then kind of uh, went back into private practice in a preferred provider clinic because I just wanted somewhere that I would be um, relaxed and happy, so to speak. Yeah. Stable, uh, yeah. And also um, kind of function at a decent pace and good give quality dentistry to my patients despite not having, um, despite having sleepless nights and that sort of thing that comes with having a young child. Yeah, so then uh, amongst all of this that's happening, you know, how did you go ahead and complete a graduate certificate in restorative dentistry? Yes, yes. So that How was that, that is uh, a lot of help, uh, an extreme amount of help. I was also, um, I'm yeah, I was also pregnant while I was doing my implant dentistry. I did not disclose it to anybody. I managed to hide my pregnancy. None of my professors knew that I had my baby. Um, but yes, you mean so you're was, walking into the room and you've got like a, a growing belly and they're like, mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, they can, you can cover it quite well. It's not that hard. Um, how, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it was a huge amount of help. I had to enlist. I, my son started school that year. He was in prep. I literally had to get my mother to come in for those six months. Um, my husband was working with the national bank at the time. He had to take long service leave for a month or two um so yes it was a significant amount of family help that made me get through those two years uh, the the one thing that did help was the fact that i had my own practice which meant that i could decide my own hours and the days that i worked with because at melbourne um i'm not sure if you've heard of it or not but it's a part-time course which goes over two years However, you have to be available on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays, pretty much the full day, which leaves only a Wednesday and Thursday to practice, mm -hmm. some half days here and there. It's very difficult to do this unless and until you have your own practice. Most of the people that do the course either have their own practice or they've been in that practice for such a long time that 
they have a loyal patient base that follows them during just those two days. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, okay. You, we, we haven't dived into how you got into your private practice yet, but you're working at, at the, you're working for the hospital and you're working at the um, corporate um, at this point. And then, so how does that transition to you working in for your own practice and doing the certificate? Yes. So that, that was the, I think that was the turning point of my career. Mm. Um, there was one day that I went to my private, to the private practice that I was working. I obviously was not getting enough patients to do either larger treatment plans to, to even, I was struggling for them to even take, to even do x-rays. It used to take me a huge amount to actually convince them to do two bite wings just so that I would be able to diagnose caries. Um, I, ha- I, I did a little bit of crown work, but it was, sing- it was predominantly single tooth dentistry. Uh, and by that time, I was obviously in, practice for so long that it was hard for me to justify just doing single tooth dentistry without explicitly looking at the mouth in full detail. Mm -hmm. Um, I also was finding, as I said, I did a lot of, um, I did some ortho, I did some Invisalign training, but I could not put it to use because I could not find the patients for it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started talking to my first boss who had recently sold his practice at the time. And he suggested that we should look at a regional practice. Mm. Uh, together. Um, so we approached Simon Palmer from Practice Sales Search, and we had this practice come up in Wonthaggi, which is 90 minutes southeast of Melbourne. It's somewhat commutable, uh, but it's a long commute. Mm-hmm. So um, I took the, I didn't even take the day off work. I decided, so Frank, my first boss said, just go and have a look. He didn't tell me what to look for, what to do, nothing of the sort. Um, I had patients booked in after one o'clock or something like that. I I had patients that day. I remember distinctly. So I pretty much went to one thaggy in the morning. I left at seven, got there at nine, looked at the books. The books looked, so the the practice at the time was a part. um, So one thaggy is a miner's town. The practice had been part of their um, community clinic since 1926. Um, It was one, there are three practices in Wanthagi. So it's, it was one of the practices. It was in two tiny rooms behind a very, very old fashioned dispensary. So it it had no street frontage. It had absolutely zero, it, it, it had equipment. We had good. They had good equipment, but it was all crammed into two tiny rooms. Wow! Um, I looked at the the books, and the books looked fairly busy in the sense that they were. I didn't even know what I was looking at, but I kind of saw that there were no gaps in the schedule. Um, so that was all I looked at. Came back, um, told my husband, told my. Um, told the first boss, they took my word for it. And we put in an offer, we got the practice, touch wood, it's never has, it. it's grown from strength to strength. Um, and we've never really had any problems with patients in that practice. So I think that was a, a stroke of luck, nothing yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, the first, I mean, cause you're looking around and you come across this one, but um, to your point, your, your, your first boss told you to kind of look in this kind of vicinity. Um, I want to just come back for a second. So you mentioned that this is quite a far, this clinic is quite far from where you're initially residing in. Mm-hmm. Your husband's working in the city. That's I mean, right. That's so, right. you know, talk to me about that kind of balance and how do you kind of figure that out? Because you're going to have to, like you said, commit more days to this one that's further out. That's right. So I bought the practice in, um, I think it was December 2014. And, um, we bought a. We moved down to Inverloch, which is a coastal town, uh, 20 minutes from the Wonthaggi practice. Uh, we kept an apartment in the city. My husband worked uh, from home two days of work in Inverloch, and he worked three days from um, the city. So literally, I was a single parent for about six months, which was quite hard because my son was three at the time. Uh, however, the, I think that was crucial because I could set up the procedures. I could... I had a fairly, um, I was able to 
kind of take the practice from a single chair to two chairs by having that commitment and being available that at that point in time mm. that from that single chair to two chair obviously pumped up our revenue and our profits and after two years yes uh, after two years we had enough money to move out of the um, those dingy two rooms into a, a, a an absolute killer location so right now we have street frontage we are across from mcdonald's yeah. we are across from the police station and um we pretty much renovated everything we bought state-of-art equipment um so we've got brand new chairs we've got a cbct we've got lasers we've got a ceric machine we've got everything you name yeah. it and everything um and um we have three chairs busy every, each day, every day, and our patients are booked out until May. So yeah. it was, it was, it was a move that was worth it. Yes. Um, so that that's the gist of it. So how does this? Okay, so you've moved into the practice and you're you've got this kind of you're growing from strength to strength. So what's happening with the CPD side thing? Because like you said, you changed, you jumped into this one because you want to do full mouth kind of treatment not just single tooth treatment so where what, what's happening at this point so um in 20 as i said in about 2014 uh, my boss suggested that i look into implants because i was always the one taking teeth out i was the one raising the flap i was i kind of enjoyed the surgical side of things mm -hmm. he did ortho so our skills kind of complemented each other uh, but he did not want to be anywhere near implants. We started having patients who were asking for it, uh, asking for the implant treatment or some sort of replacements. We also found out that um, that they had the means to pay for it. I had built up that much of a relationship with the patients at that point in time. So I looked at a number of implant courses, uh, but I'm a big fan of structured learning and I don't like um, courses that are run by companies or rep reps, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. because there's always a bias, unfortunately. Um, so I applied for the implant diploma at Melbourne University. I got through that. Um, it was it was a pretty big commitment from my side. Um, yeah. but as said, the university delivered in spades. Um, I, I was able to complete um, a patient. I was able to do a surgical placement within the first six months of being at university in my own private practice without any issues. Um, they taught me a lot of things, especially how to practice safe dentistry, which I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, so that's how I started to get into implant dentistry. I've been lucky in the uh, in the aspect that I had patients. Patients meant that I could do the treatment, and if I could do that treatment frequently, it also meant that my clinical skill set in implant dentistry grew faster than if I would not have had that many patients. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I was within whilst I was doing my university course, I was placing an implant pretty much every week. Yeah. Um, and then it got to a point where um, I'm now at a stage where we place about 250 to 300 implants every year, yeah, uh, which is a substantial amount. Um, so I'll yeah. just come back for a second. So you're saying that prior to doing the implant um, diploma, you were you doing um, smaller ones to begin with, and then realize that uh, no. you just no, no. You just straight I, up like I'm going to dive into something that's structured because I've done the cert and I know what it's going to be like and I can see right. the benefits of it. I'm just going to do with this one. No, I so I I did as I said I looked at a few uh, simple ones, especially at the time the biggest popular course was the MIS Columbia course. I did not think it was for me because it, it it meant that I would be doing a huge amount of work in over 12 days. And that's not how and it, it included sinus grafting and it, it included a lot of a lot of things which I did not find that was sustainable. Um, I did the introductory course at Melbourne Uni. It used to be called My First Implant. I don't know if they still run it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the only thing that I'd done prior. And it was just to show you how to restore a single implant. So that mm -hmm. was all I knew before I went into the course. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was good because I had no bad. I had absolutely, I didn't have any bad habits that I had to unlearn, so to mm-hmm. speak. Um, I kind of learned in a structured way. I learned in an evidence-based way. I learned how to do scientific evaluation and I, I learned how to make up my own mind. And the best thing about it is I still don't follow a single system. I have the ability to understand what a system offers. Um, and if a rep comes to me and tells me, you know, this, 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 and this, I can go home and think about it instead of saying, wow, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this tomorrow. Um, yeah. so I'm grateful about that. So prior to doing the, the, um, the implant certificate, right, diploma, are you restoring implants along the way prior to it? Or is it straight up like you just go from zero to 100 in? Maybe five to 100, not zero, because I had <laughs> restored a few. Yeah, but uh, but those few were negligible. Like I had, I would say I had restored about ten to twenty implants, mm-hmm. um, and they were they were very um, you know refer the implant to a periodontist. Uh, mm-hmm. Come come patient comes back with the implant, figure out what system system it is, ask for a loaner kit, take yes. an impression, buy the buy the coping, take an impression send it to the lab without thinking about the abutment, without thinking about the soft tissue profile. Come, The crown comes back, um, just talk it down and hope for the best. Yeah. Um, which I was- ask because a lot of our listeners are obviously recent graduates, right? And they're doing these courses and they're thinking, okay, you know, I, I'm like trying to get into it, but to your point, don't do enough reps of it. You know, how do I decide if I really want to dive into something that's, you know, a grad diploma in implants when I'm just maybe doing, you know, restoring a few because I'm just attending a few weekend courses. But to your point, you know, if you're, if you know you're going to do it, then you got to fully commit into it. And then um, only that way will you really grow properly. I agree with you on that aspect because also um, amongst all of this, I bought another practice in 2016 in another regional town and um, we found out that the practice had been had been active in implant dentistry however for some reason for about the the dentist was completely burnt out and was not doing any placements whatsoever anymore and the reason behind it was because 30 implants had failed in a single year that's a significant amount of implants the reputation damage is significant in a country practice or even in a in a city practice uh, mm-hmm. And that was for no fault of his, the, because it's it was the 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 course was unfortunately dry, or the reps or the system was driving the clinical decisions, not the biology of the patient, the physics, the restorative space. So implant dentistry or orthodontics, for that matter, should not be a weekend course. Mm-hmm. I'm not in favor of it. It's a huge amount of. Um, it changes a patient's life if it's done properly, but if something goes wrong, the stakes are higher. It's not it's not as simple as a filling that needs to be redone or a crown that needs to be redone or an indoor that needs to be redone. It essentially means that the patient is not going to be as forgiving if something goes wrong. Um, they um, definitely the, the opera or the ADA or the dental board will not be as forgiving if you just tell them the rep told me this. And, and in, in, even if everyone is forgiving, as dentists, we are A-type personalities. We don't take failure or critique very well. So in a lot of times, people will get burned out from a poor experience and never, ever do that again because they're worried about failing. So I think the, the best thing about a university course is, A, it um, makes you liaise with more people. You understand uh, how to, to do the scientific literature you understand the geometry of the implant the macro the micro the surface you understand how to apply it to the biology of the patient um, and then eventually if you need help there are so many people that will be willing to give you help because it's an academic environment and the people teach really well there yeah so, um, 
Can I, I can I just ask real quickly that, you know, a lot of recent graduates, when they graduate, they want to learn author, uh, they want to learn in place, they want to learn all of that really quickly, right? Um, but I just want to dive back into the point that you were saying how you were doing, you were doing Invisalign at one point and you couldn't find the patience for it, but somehow that transitioned to not really doing that much of it anymore. You're just doing a lot more implants. So, um, talk to me about that transition and your thoughts on recent graduates, um, with that mindset. So essentially, um, obviously I'm a lot older than I look. So I've been doing this for a very long time. I think from, from my perspective, the first thing we need to be able to do, doesn't matter whether you're a recent grad, a new grad, a dentist who just wants to do simple plain dentistry is to be able to diagnose and diagnose the full mouth effectively. You don't have to do it, explicitly don't have to do it till you can do single tooth dentistry very well, but be able to diagnose. Um, and by diagnosing, I mean, be able to understand that why um, posterior missing teeth are important. Don't go and veneer just the front six teeth because the patients asked you to without having any regard for what the back looks like. Um, have a, an understanding why fixed posterior support is superior in certain cases as opposed to just giving them a denture. Um, have an understanding on how to how movement of teeth actually occurs, what the um, what the patient's bite can have an effect on. For example, a class two div two, it's one of the hardest bites to work with or the hardest occlusions to work with. Have an understanding of if you are going to do some subtractive dentistry on a tooth, how's that going to fit into the entire mouth? Because once you cut a tooth, it's gone, like it's not going to come back. So if you're going to make that decision, it needs to be based on the fact, at least as a minimum, what the adjacent teeth looks like, what the, the periodontal status looks like, what the restorative space looks like. And once you've made that, um, that once you get into the habit of being able to diagnose the full mouth, get into the habit of doing single tooth dentistry very, very well, because you can only do full mouth dentistry if you can do single tooth dentistry well. And there are lots and lots of really good courses out there to help you get better at single tooth dentistry these days. Like, and, and there have always been traditionally. There is, um, I think there is Chris Ho who teaches this really, really well. There is Sarkis Nalbandian in Sydney who teaches it well. Um, in, in Melbourne, you've got Varun Garg who teaches quite and practices really good single tooth dentistry, uh, which fits really well with the whole arch. Um, I've seen Chi Chang's, Dr. Chi Chang's work, who's a prosthodontist. I'm not sure if he teaches here and there, but he does really good work. Um, so there's plenty of people out there who will help you get better at single tooth dentistry. And I think um, then get to anything more comprehensive like orthodontics, implants, um, even full mouth rehabilitation of some sort. Uh, because by that time, you would have an understanding of one step over the other. Um, and an overarching um, sort of a theme on top of it should be getting better at communication. So if you're going to tell a patient, um, look, uh, I don't think a danger is a great option for you, or this and this is not a great option for you, you need to be able to tell them why. And uh, at the same time, you should be able to tell them that um, if this and this procedure is carried out. This is the risks. This is the longevity. And you should be able to do it with confidence, with minimal jargon, essentially. Um, so I think, um, I really don't think new grads, at least for the first five or six, should get five or six years, should get into anything majorly comprehensive. And there is so much to learn and to do with single teeth. Uh, but that's my opinion. And I know it's an instant gratification world out there. Um, but the people, the, the associates that work with me that have really done well, have, have followed exactly this trajectory. Um, two of my associates at the moment are doing Chris Hart's, uh, Chris Ho's um, implant diploma, and they have nothing but good things to say about it. Uh, one of my ex-associates is doing Derek Mahoney's clear aligner, but they're all about nine, eight, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years out. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. What happened with your journey from wanting to do Invisalign and then transitioning to just a lot more implants? So, as I said, I didn't have a lot of patients who were interested in Invisalign. I didn't do it enough. I 
it kind of because I wasn't doing enough, I had a very limited. It was it wasn't a weekend course. It was about a year long course. Um, but the modules were pretty much two, I think, and there were there was only one hands on and two lectures. It was not it was not a structured program, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it gave me a basic understanding of the actual invisible line as a as a product, mm -hmm. but not how it would really work with the patient's biology or the mechanics of it. So yes. I think partly I did not do much of it because I could not communicate to the patients why it was important. I just would look and say, look, you could benefit from Invisalign because your teeth are not straight or so and so, and you can floss better if they're aligned better. But I would not be able to confidently tell them the benefits that or how it would improve their oral health and contribute to their oral well-being in the long term because I did not know it myself. Um, the journey from Invisalign to Im or orthodontics to um, implant dentistry, again, was just because my mentor pushed me into it. And I kind of thought, yeah, that would be nice. I enjoy surgery. Why don't I give it a go? It's something that I've always wanted to learn. Uh, I, in, I did not somehow connect a lot with the restorative when I was just sending it out to the periodontist and coming back and then loaning a kit and then putting the impression coping in and then just getting back something from the lab which would work but not every option not every time it was a great outcome or it was not a very satisfactory outcome because i was not involved with the patient's journey from start to finish mm. uh, I was, and i'm sorry i asked you that because i look the question i guess is a lot of people think do i do ortho first or do implants first and that's why i asked you you know how do you kind of decide you know which way you shift um, I want to come to your implant side of things now. So you're, we're talking about perio, like after doing the grad diploma, that your learning doesn't stop there, right? Because no, you go on and then, yes. how does that go from, you know, doing just implants, single implants to perio, soft tissue grafting, you know, how does it? Yes. So I did my implant diploma and at the time I was based in Malvern, which is, um, in the in the central part of Melbourne, um, my journey into all of this was, I think, um, I, I I was I was complete. It was a complete stroke of luck. There was nothing um, thoughtful or methodical about it. Uh, so one day I remember I so I used to play Strauman implants, and I still do. Um, I'm heavily Strauman. I obviously do other systems. And they, um, so I had a patient booked in, but um, I rang the company and they had not delivered the healing abutment because it was on back order. I did have the patient sort of booked in in the afternoon and I did not want to, um, to do, I did not want to reschedule the patient. So I said, is there anybody I could borrow a healing abutment from someone who carries a consignment of salt? So they told me that there is this dentist around the corner. Um, he he would do it. However, he's extremely moody and um, I'm not going to do it for you. I would not send the staff. If you are that keen, you can go there yourself. Um, I said, that's fine. I mean, the worst thing he can do is he can say no. That dentist turned out to be Dr. Hillel New, who was absolutely charming, magnificent. He did not only give me a healing abutment. He sat down with me. He guided through all my cases. He told me to come and watch him. He's an absolute fantastic surgeon. His suturing is brilliant. His technique is wonderful. I've never come across a better, better surgeon. Um, and that was it. And after that, I would literally just go down, take my patients to his practice, do it under either his supervision, or if it was a hard case like an implant, like an immediate, I would just um, scrub it in and assist. Um, I saw him doing complex and it did not matter. He would just let me know if I had a difficult case, I would book it with him. If I had an easier case, I would book it, in, book it in his surgery, but do it myself. And if he had a case that he thought would interest me, he would let me know. So for from about 2018 to about for the next three years, I literally worked with him or alongside him or saw what he was doing almost 
twice or thrice a week. And that was the biggest <laughs> thing. But um, I just wanna I just wanna get this right. So you went and saw a a a an a clinician, let's say call him just down the road. That's Is that right. what you're saying? That's yeah, right. and, and that is right. <laughs> and that's how you just fought gel and then it just happened. That's like, right. You know, when when a person listens to that, you know, and you're working in metropolitan um, it, or or any other suburb, like that just does not make sense. And exactly. then you, so yeah, wow, okay. But this this shows that sometimes all you have to do is reach out and say, hey, can I get some help? But and and we ha- we were literally my practice and Hillel's practice is literally. Five, not even 500 meters apart. The fact that he opened his doors and he said, come in any time and I'll help you and I'll help your patients um, essentially proves to you that he was a confident man who's confident in his skills um, and really um, was, uh, was, was trusting enough of me to come, let, him, let me come into his practice and watch he did each day, every day. He was also a part of the All on Four uh, the group at the time, and he worked alongside um, Alex Fibishenko. I did not know Alex for a very long time. However, I would go, um, if, I, if I started to dabble in some full arch cases with Hillel in the sense that I would refer them to him. He would help me plan, he would plan, he would diagnose, he would show it to me, and he would let me scrub up and assist in theater. So I think we st- I started to get into theater pretty much since 2018. Um, eventually, I could get into, I started restoring all on fours. I'm glad that he would not let me do it for a very long time because I, I, I figured uh, that it would, I, it's easy. I'm just screwing things and I know how to do it. I've done so many implants, but it's not as simple as that. Um, it involves a huge amount of um, follow-ups it involves making sure that there is enough keratinized tissue it involves a, a, it's a whole gamut um, of different techniques uh, and in about 2020 i think alex had seen me at the clinic about 50 100 times standing there and assisting so he came down to my practice during lockdown only because he had nothing else to do <laughs> and he's, he's a really busy man and he must be getting bored so he came to to the practice he saw my practice, he saw how I operated, he um, looked at some of my patients, he looked at some of my work, he saw how I did clinical dentistry and um, pretty much looked around the practices, spoke a few words, went home, told his electricians, I became a part of the All on Four and within three days I had a fully functioning um, operating theater running. Uh, and we started doing patients in a month after Alex was here under general anesthetic. Wow. Okay. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa. Okay. Let's unpack this for a second because there's a lot of moving parts here. So, your 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 um, dentist colleague next door is t- is assisting you, teaching you. Um, are you going outside to learn more kind of CPD courses yes. on yes. these kind yes. of things along the way yes. to kind of complement it all? Yes. Or? yes. Yes. So um, I used to, um, so at the time I did, um, so this was in 2018 and 2019 prior to COVID. Obviously it all stopped then. Uh, However, I did a sinus lift course with, and some advanced drafting course with Sasha Johanovich in Sydney and Chris Ho. I also um, did some GBR and soft tissue courses along the way. Um, I wouldn't, I I think the GBR was all right. The, The bone the, the, regi- the guided bone regeneration was okay. I could sort of use it. Um, the sinus lift at the time was a complete waste. And mm-hmm. I'm the reason it was completely a waste was because A, it was done on a goat or a sheep head. It didn't make any sense to me at the time. I was very green. I should have not done it. I should have not even been allowed to do it because I had no idea. I'd never in my life seen a sinus lift in an actual human being. So it didn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I kind of did um, some, but at the time I started to do some soft tissue courses. There's a dentist called Tino Mercado in Sydney. He, you probably have heard of him. He's a periodontist. Yes. Um, so I did some soft tissue courses. I did some soft tissue grafting. Um, so yes, so I did those. However, I could only, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that if I learn something, I don't go Monday morning and start doing that on my patients. I really don't do that. 
I will first learn something. I will then uh, sit down, have a really good think about it. I will then identify a patient who will need it. I will then tell my mentors that this is the case that I identified. I would you. I will then get them to do it, and I will assist. Then I will find another patient. Then I will uh, I'll do the patient myself. Get my mentor to scrub in and assist. Do that at least ten times before wow. I will do that patient myself. I am also lucky that I have mentors um, and not one who I have who have been generous with their time to be to help me out in these endeavors. So. I'm lucky and I'm grateful that I've maintained these relationships. And you're, you're picking these courses uh, from the recommendation from your mentors or is this something that you're kind of like, okay, this is, okay, yeah. So it's a mix. Um, so it's mentors. Um, one of my very, very early mentors is Kalyan Goruganti. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. So he was my first implant mentor. Um, but I've done, um, so I do, um, I pick them up from DPR. I run it past my mentors. I then ask a few more people. I kind of make it, I, I, it's, it's, I don't have one person that I go to, I have multiple. And then I make my own mind up and not every course. I mean, I don't go to every course expecting that it will be a five-star course. I often will go to a course for the company um, for the people, um, I'll go to a course. Uh, for me, not, not a single CPD has ever gone to waste. I've made good friends. I've made lifelong friends. I've met really good people. I've met bright people. Um, so I don't, I don't consider any. I think the only thing it has been is there have been some CPDs that I have chosen to do that I was not ready at that point in time myself, clinically, academically, or even... Um, uh, even in a, in a position that my practice was able to provide to me those patients. So purely um, not the CPD's fault. It's just that it was either too early for me or it was too premature. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, I've, never, I'm, I'm, I've always enjoyed every CPD I've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm starting to get this idea that um, you like to be um, confident and um, get a few reps in in terms of observing and being sure of what you're kind of doing and fully understanding it um, before you really want to do it yourself. That's right. That's right. Yes. So I assisted before I did my first all on four unassisted uh, the actual surgery of it. I had done. I had physically assisted or worked under supervision supervision for about 150 arches. Okay. So, <laughs> yes, so, and I'm happy I did it that way because I saw every complication. Um, I saw management of every complication. And then when I physically did it, um, we did have a complication that I was able to sort out on the spot. Uh, but more than anything, I had the blessings. So if something went wrong, I knew that my mentors or the people that I trust would, would be able to help me out because I'd done exactly what they asked me to do and mm -hmm. done as much as I could uh, before I, I mean, there you have to draw a line somewhere and you've got to start doing your own thing. Um, but I'm quite conservative because the patient, I do not think that my patients are um, guinea pigs or um, at the end of the day, they are paying for a result and that result needs to be delivered to them in a, in, in a decent manner um, the quality of the work should be of high clinical standard and they should spend as little time in GA or in the chair as possible uh, because no one, you know, no one really wants to be under for six hours while I'm trying to fluff around. So, so I'm proud I did my first uh, surgery in under two and a half hours, including the impressions. Mm -hmm. um, the patient was super happy. She applied for a position in our practice. She was that happy. So that was a good result. <laughs> I'd yes. Say. Yeah, so for me, it's about the people. It's not about the procedure. It's not about getting good at it. It's not about the glamour. For me, it's the person. And I find that every patient uh, of mine is, is I, I, I get attached to them. Um, I find them, like, I don't know. I, I don't, I've never judged a patient, but I get attached to them to the point that I find their stories 
I know their family. I know where the dog is. I don't even have to write it down in exact. I pretty much remember all of it. Um, so for me, it's about the person. It's not about, I, I'm not there to give him or her four implants. I'm there to change their life if I can in any way, shape or form. Yeah, so that's my that's my approach to the industry. I want to come into the aspect of when you're talking about you had a great mentoring experience, right? Yeah, multiple great. mentors. Absolutely great. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, how do you I mean, when graduates come to you and be like, I want mentoring, but you know, people interpret that differently. So right. what would you say to, you know, recent graduates looking for mentoring and finding the right mentor? Mentoring is a two way relationship. It doesn't work single handedly. Mentoring is also not coaching or holding your hand, and neither is it providing you a formula for, for, for how to do your treatment. And I'm glad you've touched upon this because I have been accused in the past of not providing enough support or mentoring. So I'll tell you what I, what I find and how I have my mentor-mentee relationship and how I, I expect similar. So um, for instance, I've uh, if I give my mentor um, this is the sinus lift I'm planning to do. And he looks at my window, he kicks me in the shins if it's really bad. Actually, uh, he tells me, what have you done? He screams at me in front of all my staff. Um, and then after 10 minutes, he helps me. He tells me exactly what to do. And then he goes home and he tells me, this is exactly what you did right. This is exactly what you did wrong. I do not want this to happen again. So you've got to be a little bit thick skinned, especially with the older ones. However, they mean well. Um, it, I have not ever asked my uh, mentors to look at my x-ray and come up with a treatment plan. I do it all myself. I will send them a CBCT, planned CBCT the night before. I will tell them my exact plan, what I'm going to do A to B. I will tell them what complications can happen. And then afterwards, um, after the treatment has gone, I actually go back to them when they have time. It, it always is when they have time um, as to what I could have done better. And then they will tell me, and that's how I've grown. Um, step one is to do all of the planning yourself. Step two is to do the treatment. Step three is to reflect. I've never had, um, I don't have, I have no one really gives you the formula. No one really gives you, um, no one really holds your hand and guides you. Yes, if there is an issue, they will bail you out of it. Um, but essentially it's not one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and it's certainly not an academic university demonstrator who's overlooking my shoulder and saying, do this and do that. That's not what mentoring is. Uh, mentoring is for me um, an, a relationship where each person is responsible for their own actions, but has, a, in a sense, asks for help in a professional way and gets as much help as the mentor can provide. So um, the, the relationship is driven more by the mentee. Like I will go up to them, I will ask them, I will ask, I will ask them out for lunch. I will say, can we meet? It's always me. It's always me asking them for questions. It's always me taking them out for lunch. It's always me offering to buy them lunch. And half of the times when I take them out for lunch, they pay for it because they're older, but I initiate that conversation. I initiate that meeting and I never say um, I'm not available. I say, what times are you available and make it fit? Wherever they want me to do it, I will do it. So I'm very flexible in that way. Um, so whereas when I find um, some, some of the mentees are really good, some of them expect university level support. So that does not exist. You have to be mindful of the fact that someone with that skill set will be really, really busy. Um, they have a business to run, they have patients to see. So you, you have to make it fit around them. Don't not expect them to, to make that extra distance for you. Um, the relationship also needs to be that of a fun relationship. You need, I mean, I, I, I believe I add some value to their life <laughs> like they do to mine. Um, so it has to be, it has to be somewhat of a, you have to have the same mindset like, you know, have a joke, have a laugh. Not everything has to be serious. Again, as I said, go out, have lunches. Um, if my mentor is doing a course, I'll just blindly sign up for it and do it. Because, you know, it's my way of saying, I'm gonna be there. I want to be, I want to support you in whatever you do. 
and I don't take your mentoring for granted. So these are my ways. And I'm I'm fortunate enough to, as I said, have mentors who've given so much that I I can't put a dollar value on it. However, my if I if if I can add some little value to their life and make them smile, um, I can do what I can. There's nothing more I can do for them. They're already doing so much for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the Indian culture, there's something called a guru shishya relationship, and uh, it's kind of um, drilled down upon us. So the relationship is not. Uh, it it it's it's an equal relationship, but it's not an equal relationship in that sense. Someone is taking your time out of their day, which they don't necessarily have to, um, to improve your clinical and you know improve your clinical skill set to improve the quality of your dentistry. Essentially, contributing to 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 making you a better person clinically, a better human being. Um, so the, the, the reward is for them is for you to be able to do it properly um, and to be able to acknowledge that they have in some way, shape or form contributed to it. That's all they want. They really don't care about a lunch. They make enough money or they don't care about that coffee that you will make for them. Uh, it's just that little acknowledgement that, you know, we have this relationship and, um, you know, I'm grateful for you to be in my life and have that active contribution to it. So that's how I see it. Um, if people hearing this can understand, it would be great because that's what a mentor-mentee relationship, it's not coaching, it's not holding your hands, it's not providing you with a formula. And it's certainly not mimicking your mentor. You can't be them. Um, I'm Vandana and they are Alex and they are Hillel. I can't be one of them. I will have my own flavor to what I do, um, and, but they're there to guide me to become the better version of myself. That's yeah. how I see it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the first time you like you said that when someone when you're doing something and it might go not exact ideally, and you're getting told off at in surgery in front of everyone else, that would be a very um, um, confronting experience, I would say. It's confronting. It's confronting. Um, it's definitely an old-fashioned way of being taught. It's not. It's not necessarily. It's not necessarily motivating at that point in time. But if you look, if you have a slightly thicker skin, and you see where it's coming from, and you understand that it's not out of putting you down or trying to shame you, but but that's just how they communicate. Um, I think it's fine because at the end of the day, you know, that person is a great surgeon and it's, he's, he's, he's brilliant at what he does. He can't be great at everything. So I don't, he's not a university level academic. I can't expect that type of, you know, and the reason I am a bit more mature about it is because I, uh, my son is 10 and I spent a um, couple of years, as you know, homeschooling him and, um, at the end of the ten, at the end of the two year, I asked my son as to how it went and was he happy to go back to school, and he said, "I'm, you're a great mother, but you're a horrible teacher," <laughs> and, <laughs> and I and I, I fully acknowledge that I'm not a good teacher because I'm not I've I have done absolutely zero professional training, um, so if 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 someone is an academic, they teach well. It's their it's how they they do it. It's um, it's an added qualification and it's a part of their personality. Whereas this mentor that who's taking time out of my day is not a teacher. He's not chosen to be a university teacher. He's basically giving that time out of, you know, the goodness of his heart or goodness to his profession or whatever it is um, to someone so that they can be a better dentist. I need to keep that in the back of my mind. His delivery is not going to be what I'm expecting. It could be anything. As long as I get the results and my patients are in a better place, I think I'm thick skinned enough to understand where it's coming from. Um, yeah. And if I, if, I, if, I, if I choose to get demotivated and run away, it's probably my loss, not his. <laughs> <laughs> so. so if you could share some words of wisdom to your younger self, what would it be? To my young self? Yeah. 
Um, so to my young self, I would choose. Um, so there's a couple of things that I would really go back and do differently. Not too many, because I don't really have many regrets. Uh, the one thing that I would do is I would have had more fun in university. I was too hung up on being this really good girl, getting good scores, which was completely unnecessary at the time. I should have had more fun. I should have gone to more movies. I should have, I should have basically lived my life. Um, there was no need to get a distinction every year um, to, because to, it was all irrelevant at the end of it. Um, it was all academic, nothing practical. Um, and I should have basically um, lived my life at the time. And um, the second thing that I, I think I could have done um, differently is um, that I should have had my kids a little bit older. I don't regret it now. Uh, but I was relatively young when I had my children, uh, which obviously meant that there were, at, at one point in time, I had a five-year-old and I was pregnant and I had three practices and I was also doing my implant diploma. So, um, yes, so that was a huge amount of stress, not on myself, because I'm not someone who takes stress, but on the rest of my family. So I'm, I'm sorry I put them through all of that. Um, it also meant uh, that at times, you know, I would get quite agitated because of the pressures and it was not particularly pleasant for my family. So I think if I had children a little bit later on in life, it's all worked out very well. You know, I'm, I'm not even 40 and I have an 11 year old and a six year old and all of those things. Um, and now I'm free to do what I want to. However, at that point in time, if I would have delayed having kids a little bit because the thing is, we, 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 we want to do things quickly and you want to rush into things doing quickly. If I had my kids a little bit later on, um, I could have done, had a practice, settled it, done my diploma, settled it, and then had my kid and then do this and then do that. Then I would have done one thing at a time instead of piling everything together. Yeah, because there in in our demo, in my demographic of graduates like more than 50% of us are females Correct. and they Correct. come out Correct. Correct. with yes. one yes. a lot of debt you know one trying to be a great super dentist two you know thinking about their Correct. other yes. um, natural um, life like kids family how do mm. they kind of put that all to kind of together right because that's a mm. it is hard it is hard um, and the thing is it doesn't need to be. I mean, having a child at 30 or 32 is not going to make a huge difference when we are all living up to 90. It's more about the fact that you need to be available for your kid at the time. And also, I think, um, professionally satisfied. No one really is going to ask you 20 years down the track that why did you not have your child at 28 and why did you have your child at 32? No one really cares. Uh, but, you know, for your peace of mind, it's and also the ability to take time off, the ability to not take time off. Um, it's, it, it, it is a decision that is difficult at the best of times, but piling it all up together and doing it under duress makes it even worse. Um, and then again, as I said, I was lucky enough that I had a young mother who was able to, to deal with my tantrums. Um, but a lot of people might not have that support network and that's, that can cause a huge amount of stress. Because you've got to, you 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 have to enjoy your career. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter, uh, you know, if you've gone ahead, you've gone through dental school. It doesn't matter if you do three days a week, one day a week, two days, whatever it is. You need to enjoy it. You need to enjoy your patients. You need to still have a family life and whatever it is, you know, be with your partner. You need to spend time with your child because um that is one of my major regrets because i was having so much going on and that i was not available for my children at that point in time so uh, i would definitely do those things differently yeah well Dr. Madonna, there's so many more questions i actually want to ask you but that's all the time we've got for today uh, no i want to thank problem. you thank Sorry. you thank you for having me i i know i have a lot lot to to discuss uh, but we could carry on later on <laughs> we can yes. do this when we're in sydney or, <laughs> or we'll even come to melbourne yes yes so um um i want to thank you again for coming on the show today if you could let the people know how they can find you or what you've got going on in your life so, um so i have a linkedin profile where i post a lot of my work um it's uh 
I, I can send it to you and an Instagram as well, where we put, put work. Um, I can link up the websites of the practice as well. So you can have a bit of a look at what the work we do. No worries. We'll definitely leave in the show notes below. So for our viewers, if you like this episode, drop a comment below on your favorite part, but don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next episode of CPD Junkie Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>